very special guest today. Today we're going to talk to a local Los Angeles-based guitar player and composer and longtime friend of mine. Let's bring in David Boswell. Hey, thank Dave. you so much for inviting me. Welcome. Good to see you. Cool Good little uh, studio you got there. Thank you. And your guitar uh, and uh, all yeah. kinds of stuff. So anyway, we'll talk about uh, maybe some of your records and uh, we'll have a chance to talk about some vinyl. I know you're a vinyl collector. Guys, I've known Dave for like more than 30 years and, uh, you know, we used to hang out together a lot and, and uh, go to see a lot of shows and congratulations, Dave. It looks like, what is this, your fourth or fifth record release? Uh, it's actually number six. Oh my God, I'm not keeping track. <laughs> I don't have them all. I have some that's of good. them. That's a good, number that's six, a good that's friend. great. Congratulations yeah. on that. Six. Thank you. So uh, uh, Dave, Dave and I share an interest in jazz and he was my guitar teacher for a while, probably the best guitar teacher I ever had. I was probably the worst student you ever had because I never practiced yeah. and uh, didn't <laughs> learn to read music. But uh, you got some great players on your new record. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the record? Do you have a copy to like show us? Or yeah, I do. Um, here we go. Try and get it right in the camera. Yeah, you got a little glare there. Uh, I can't. Sorry. I can't see with my eyes, but that doesn't mean everybody else can't see. Yeah. So it's it's entitled the story behind the story, uh -huh. and um, <clears throat> I uh, brought Jimmy Haslip in as a producer. So we co-produced it together, and and I've been working with him for uh, gosh the last ten years. So it's not been on the and, and and for my viewers who don't know Jimmy Haslip, of course so one of the Haslip greatest bass players founding, around. Yeah, yeah, one of the founding members of the, of the Yellow Jackets and. He's played with Alan Holdsworth and pretty much anybody and everybody. I mean, he's you know, Robin Ford. I mean, he plays just, the uh, the six or the eight or the twenty string bass. He's got a lot of strings on that thing. And well, and he plays it. He's upside he's down, left hander. So right. he took a right handed bass and plays it just a right handed bass upside down. So everybody's like, "What? Like, what are you doing?" Yeah. So anyways, he's. Uh, He's great, and so I brought him in uh, as a producer on the project, and um, he was able to, you know, help me bring some some heavy, you know, players into it, and and I had some guys kind of lined up that I wanted to bring into it as well. Um, I, I saw I, I saw Jim Jimmy play with you at the Baked Potato once. I got to meet him that time. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, very cool, down to earth guy. I think he studied with Jocko yes, at one point. He's kind of he like. Did carry on that tradition of uh, yeah. that style of bass playing. Yeah, he did. And um, yeah, he's he's been great to work with and um, I'm looking forward to working with him more uh, on future projects and hopefully doing some collaborative stuff as well. And, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if you want me to talk more about the record now or later. I bet you or, do. Yeah, let's hear well, what sure. else do we need to know about your record? Well, um, we're going to sell a few well, copies today. Well, that would be great. I can tell you who's on it. Um, I'm reading here my cue sheet. Uh, so Mitchell Foreman is on piano and keyboards. Yeah, uh, love Andy his Gordy. piano playing. Yeah, for sure. Mitch, Mitch is great. Um, MB Gordy plays drums on most of the record. Uh, yeah. Drums and percussion. You've worked with him a lot in the past. Yeah, worked. he's on all my records. Um, and just won a Grammy last year for Opium Moon. So wow, for, I didn't know that. That he was in. Yes. Yeah, so wow. Cool. Grammy winner, which is exciting. Um, and then, of course, Jimmy plays bass on uh, half the record. And then uh, Scott Kinsey. I don't know. Do you, are you familiar with Scott Kinsey? I just saw something online about him and the baked potato. And I, I saw like this little picture. Is that Dave? That looks like Dave. Are you playing with, <laughs> you play with him sometimes? Yeah, I haven't played live with him, but uh, that is something I'm really looking forward to. Scott's just... Uh, like a freaky genius keyboard player. He's like Zawinol. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to see the closest thing to Joe Zawinol, it's Scott Kinsey. And he played with Tribal Tech and has done a lot of, uh, actually, he kind of was Zawinol's protege. So he kind of worked with huh. Zawinol when he was still alive. So, so you, got, um, you got the whole, uh, cool. Yeah, so he's great. And then Gary Novak plays drums on. Yeah, on I've seen him play. I saw him play with Robin right. Ford a while ago, which was an amazing show. Yeah, he's he's unbelievable drummer. And then Otmaro Ruiz, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's played with, uh, he's now playing with uh, Protocol 
um, Simon Phillips band. And it's he's an incredible keyboard player. He plays piano on, the, on one of the tunes. You, you and, only have three keyboard players? Yeah, only three keyboard players. Okay, well, hopefully that should be uh, enough. Actually, not all the tunes have keyboards. It's funny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? So I, I spread them out. And then Bart Samolis plays bass. And um, I wanted to have acoustic bass on this record, sort of bring more of a jazz thing. So he plays on half the, half the record, um, the acoustic bass. And uh, beautiful playing. He plays with... Uh, his wife, Lori Andrews, who is a uh, electric harpist, jazz harpist, and, mm -hmm. um, and he's like the session guy for film and television. His IMDb page just keeps running for all the stuff he's played on. We'll so check fantastic. that out. Yeah. And we've so, done some live stuff together, too. He's so are these all originals? Boswell originals for the most part? These are all originals except mm -hmm. for one tune. Um, tune's called Innocence. Uh, when I... Uh, let me just get one more musician in here, and then I'll. There's show more. And Andy Snitzer. There's more. There's more. Andy Snitzer plays. <laughs> horn saxophone. player. Yeah, he yeah, know yeah, is a horn player. player. Great. And it plays with Jeff Lorber Fusion, and uh, just hit tours with the Rolling Stones and everybody. I mean, he's just an amazing guy. So he plays on a couple tracks. So I got sort of this great like dream team of musicians together for this that record. That is a pretty uh, heavy duty lineup you've got there. Yeah, it was cool. And so, you know, when Jimmy and I were sitting down and I was, we were going through the music and stuff like that, when we were kind of first putting the project together. Um, he said, Hey, you know, I've got this tune. Would you be open to doing one of my tunes on, on the record? I'm like, yeah, let's hear it. Why not? And so it was a tune that he wrote with a guitar player, Barry Coates. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a tune called Innocence. And uh, it's just beautiful. It's it's uh, in three, four. So a lot of my music is written in three. Mm. Um, and so it was kind of like perfect. <laughs> when I heard it, I'm like, right in. oh my God, this is, this is perfect. This is perfect. I can't wait. I, st I still haven't even heard your, the new record. Well, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that it's soon. Not even out. It's not even out. <laughs> it's not even well, out. Well, I mean, for that reviewing Ooh. community. Yes. For yes. the... For the music journalists, I'm a fake music well, journalist. A promo copy, not a real copy, though. Signed copy. Yeah, not a real copy, a signed promo copy. Cool. <laughs> well, looking forward to hearing that. And uh, yeah. are you guys going to be doing any uh, uh, performing? Well, that's kind of a dumb question well, yeah, in today's that's, world. No, it's, that's it's a, <laughs> there not, is no performing. You know, I know it's so. There's so little. I know the baked potatoes started doing some Friday and Saturday nights, and it, you know, that's such a gem of a club, as you know, and. Um, so, yeah, for for our for our listeners out of out of LA, the Baked Potato is probably LA's most famous jazz club, yeah. and it's really the hangout of the LA studio musician set. Any given day, the audience and the stage will be full of top studio musicians in the world. So, right. I've seen you play there. You know, I've been there. Cool place. I wish I could get there more often. Anyway, yeah. are they charging for that? Is that like a free no. online concert or no? It's it's not free. The Baked online. Potato. It's a yeah, it's like a. Um, they're streaming it, and the sound mm -hmm. is amazing. Mm -hmm. The video is amazing, and I would recommend it to anybody around the world. It's really great because a lot of people in Europe, uh, you know, would come to LA and want to go to the Baked Potato because it's a world famous club, and now they can stream some of these shows down there. They can probably that? show a, get a lot more audience by streaming than uh, cramming people into those uh, so. 12 <laughs> seats they have crammed in there. I know. I and it's know. too freaking late. Their, their early show is 9.30. That's too I late know. for well, an old guy like me who has to go to work. <laughs> I'm not a I musician. I, was... I have to, like, go to work. It's funny. I think they originally set that up because it was, you know, a lot of studio guys and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So they would be good studio guys would be working in a studio until 7, 8 o'clock at night. And yeah. then just head down to the potato and play. So I think they initially set that up, and now they're actually doing the streaming things like seven o'clock. So oh, good. We can have an early bird special for us we old can folks, that, right? For the old yeah. us old folks. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's cool. So um, we'll switch gears a little bit and talk about your cool. past. Your your uh, your past. Um, past. <laughs> you know, I was attracted to you mm -hmm. as a get as as the guitar teacher. Just talking teacher here because I heard you studied with Pat Metheny and you and I both went through this insane major Pat Metheny phase. We're both probably still in it, but yeah. can you tell uh, our people 
kind of how you got to uh, work with Pat Metheny and that group of guys way way back when? Um, I you know if you don't I, mind. Yeah, no, not at all. It's it's it was kind of weird. I kind of stumbled upon him when I was a kid. I was probably sixteen, and um, I used to go. I used to take the bus down. You know, it was before I think I was even driving. I might have been fifteen years old, and we would take the bus down to use record stores in San Jose, where I grew up. And there was this poster on one of the one of our trips down. There was a poster for this jazz rock guitarist playing at San Jose State. So I'm like, okay, cool. I'm gonna go check it out. Late 70s. And yes. This was yeah, 78, 78. Right. And um, so get there. There's hardly anybody in the state in the in the auditorium. You know, it was a, it was a civic auditorium at the college there. And uh, so we get there about an hour before and we're sitting in the front row and Pat comes out and it's the original quartet, you know, from 78 and they just started playing phase dance. And within like the first three notes, I was like, oh my gosh, what, what is going on here? What's going on? Here? <laughs> like, like it was like, it just kind of like, there was this sort of uh, it like, just dug deep into my soul what he was doing and what the band was doing and the music and all this stuff. And so um, I was like an immediate fan. And so then I kind of would, every, you know, and he was touring like 300 nights a year. It was ridiculous, you know. And so I, I picked up that record and I'll talk about that. I might as well talk about it. So this this was the, the Pat Metheny Group record. The White and, Album, we call it. The, the White Album. The other White Album. Signed. I have actually have another copy of it that's completely, completely worn out. And so this was like a second copy that I got to have him sign. I've, I've like three copies album. on vinyl and two or three copies on CD. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just one of these crazy things. And so um, I played, I had that just sitting on the turntable the whole time, you know. And um, one of the tunes, San Lorenzo, is played on 12 string and it's played with a very odd tuning and I couldn't really figure out what the tuning was for that and I was really curious what it was so I wrote a letter to him um, wow. and sent it to Ted Ted Curlin his manager and um, not really thinking you know that I was going to get a response but I thought you know it's cool I'm going to send the letter and I'm saying God I've been trying to figure out what the tuning is on this tune and you know and I put my phone number there so like a month and a half later, I'm, I was in bed. It was like 10 o'clock at night and I get this phone call at home. My mom says, Hey, Dave, uh, Pat Matheny's on the phone for you. I'm like, what? Get out of here. <laughs> right. And my friend, and it's funny, like my, my, I had a high school friend named Greg as well. So I, I get on the phone, I go, hello. And he says, hi, this is Pat Matheny. I said, Greg, and I thought he was just messing with me, right? So, so he goes, "No, really, this is this is Pat. I just got off tour with Joni Mitchell, and I got your letter." And uh, so he goes, "You got a pen?" I'll. He was kind of like I'm getting right to the point, you know, and, and like get a pen. I'll give you the tuning right now until he didn't have a secretary send it to you. He just I'm did like, it himself. No, yeah, right. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, I'm like, okay, I'm grabbing a pen. I'm writing it down on, you know, it was, it was crazy, and. Um, so yeah, so he, he told me what the tuning was. It's it's based on an E flat pentatonic scale, if anybody wants to know that. And I think later on, many years later, it was like disclosed in a in a uh, guitar player interview or something like that. I remember seeing it. But um, anyway, so that was kind of my connection. And then I then I went and saw him play in San Francisco, and we met after the show. And and so we kind of got to know each other every time he'd come into town. And then. Uh, there was a workshop after after he had done 8081, uh, which is a phenomenal album. I don't have it right here, but uh, oh. after he had done that record, there was a workshop that was advertised in Downbeat Magazine. It was this tiny little ad in the very back of Downbeat Magazine. And it was in a workshop with Pat Math in New York with Pat Metheny, Jack DeJanet, and Dave Holland. And so They're pretty I, good, I hear. Uh, they're pretty good. They're, you know, they're no slouches. And so I 
you know, wrote my application into them and, you know, for the workshop and they accepted me into this, into this uh, 10 day workshop. And so I went to New York, it was over New Year's. And um, so how, how old were you about back then? I was 18. Wow. 18, 18 I was 19 years old because I was, it was over 81, 82. So mm -hmm. it was the New Year's Eve of um, 1982. Um, so it was, I always remember because it, it was the year after 8081 came out. And right. so I was in high school. Workshop. It was and it was just fantastic. And so you uh, and some other young players. Yeah, it was it was like not just guitar, was, but no, not just guitar. It was actually like thirty musicians, mm -hmm. and it was drummers, piano, horn players, um, and guitar players. I think there were six guitar players total. So it was like one of six. And what we did is we split into like three different ensembles and then each day you'd have like your day with pat and then the next day you'd be with jack and then the next day you'd be with dave and you'd play their tunes and it was just or you know or, or you play like you know, i remember when I, with pat we played sea song we did this really cool version of sea song and um and it, and then you know pat kind of interacted and talked to us about you know like what we could do and and, and stuff like that um and that but that that week made me realize that I had no idea what jazz was. <laughs> like I really like I was like, I remember telling Jack Dijonet, I think I, I think when I get back, I need to get the real book because I didn't even know what the real book is. And for anybody who doesn't know what the real book is, it's a it's a book, it's a fake book of music that is just like lead sheets of jazz right. standards. You know, I think I have so one because because you made me get one. Yeah, so it's like one of those things where you kind of got to have it. So, but it's it's a bad know. joke because musicians play out of fake books, and this is not the fake book. This is the real book. It's a, like a dumb jazz musician joke. Exactly. It's anyway, real. So, um, so there was just like this really crazy, uh, you know, um, awakening for me about like, oh my god, I like I really don't know anything about jazz like so that. before that you were more like into like beatles and pop music and rock music before really this era the, yeah i mean i started kind of getting into jazz through you know you know after being turned on to pat but i didn't really understand it and i wasn't studying it and that kind of thing i mean i started to kind of dig in a little bit but it wasn't anything uh like i ended up doing you know and um yeah, so uh, so I came, so actually it was kind of cool too. Pat referred me to John Abercrombie because John Abercrombie was living in San Francisco at the time. And so I was living in San Jose area. And he said, he gave, I think he gave me John's number and said, hey, you know, when you get back, call John and take, take some lessons from John. It'd be great. Wow. You know, so it was, that was really cool. So I ended up doing that. It was interesting. You know, maybe I didn't know like some of the particulars about jazz or, or um, you know, a lot of about improvising and stuff like that um, in terms of theory and things like that. But when I took the lessons with John, it was really interesting because he, I only took two lessons from him too, by the way. And af after I uh, took, you know, my second lesson, he goes, you know, you don't really need to take lessons. You just need to play a lot. <laughs> You know, he, he said, you just need to play a lot. And that was his thing. Cause we, cause we would play together and I would improvise over what he was playing. And fortunately I have this uh, gifted with a great ear. So I could kind of just, you know, really figure stuff out just with my ear, not even thinking about any of the theory stuff. And um, so that was kind of cool. So then I just, you know, I kind of took that and ran with it and just said, okay, I'm just going to play a lot. And I did. I just started practicing like six to eight yeah, hours. Yeah, I remember you never you played constantly. <laughs> oh, just, yeah, ridiculous. And that's my problem. I didn't. I didn't play. I didn't practice enough. So, uh, yeah, cool story. So, I guess you sort of have been, remained uh, lifelong friends, or at least acquaintances with Pat, and you've uh, run yeah. into him once in a while. So that's cool. Um, why don't we 
talk about some other records that you want to show that maybe were influential or important to you. I think you brought a, a few with you today. Yeah, you still, you still have record. You still play records at home versus CDs. I, I don't right now, and I need to. You know, if anybody wants to reach out to me and send me, or you, maybe you can give me a suggestion on the <laughs> turntable that for Bluetooth and. I have. Uh, I think I have <laughs> six turntables hooked up in my house right now. Oh, okay. So, well, maybe I'll send you a CD and you send me a turntable. How's that? <laughs> I may have an extra. I used to find them at the Goodwill all the time. It's not easy oh to do anymore. God. But I'm also into the sort of high-end audio geekness, yeah, yeah, which is yeah. its own, okay, uh, it's, it's own uh, uh, addiction. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, I know my, when uh, we used to hang out. As you can see. Yeah. Well, you probably have more guitars than me. I'm up to 10 or 11. So oh, wow. yeah, show us some records, and I may I may so, toss in a record once in a while too. Okay, cool. So I'm going to show you. This is interesting. I'm going to show you actually. Um, when after I came back from that workshop um, with with Pat, one of the things they talked about, we talked about business one afternoon, and one of the things they said is, "You got to make a record. Like if you want." And this, you know, this is in the early '80s, and they so it was like you, when you get back figure out a way to get some money to make a record. So this is actually the very first record I ever did. It's vinyl. It's, wow. It's the band oh, yeah. Band. I remember. We, we came back, you know, I came back from this workshop and, and, um, and it's maybe hard to read, but anyway, so this was my, this was our very first record. That so does that have, made. does that have Chris on it on drums? Um, this is Chris Clark. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So that he's the guy that introduced us. Chris and I worked yeah. at the record store together and he said, Oh, you like Pat Metheny? You got to meet this guy, Dave. <laughs> like who's Dave. And then anyway, yeah. rest is history. So yeah. That, Chris so that, is cool that, was, <laughs> that was the first record. And then, um, gosh, I mean, I'm just, and that's more of a pop rock record. Yeah. It was, it was kind of, it was, it was a rock thing. And, um, and actually, you know, after we made that record, we played in San Francisco for a while and stuff like that. That was when I decided I, I need to get really serious about this and come down to LA and go to music school. That's so that's what brought me to LA, and I've been been down here ever since. Right, but, um, many decades. But, and 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 so I went to music school for a year, and I started a, a jazz trio. Um, a, after that, I was uh, turned on to the bass player that had just moved from Boston, Dean Taba, mm -hmm. and um, so we we put this trio together. And the probably the biggest influence for this trio is is the this record I'll show you in a second. Um, I was when I was living up in Northern California, I was driving to work. Uh, like I was I think I was like 19 years old or 18 years old, and I heard this incredible music. Just it was there was so much static uh, on the radio. But I heard this incredible music, and I'm and I'm like, oh my god! The only thing I could get from the DJ was Arrowhead, and so, <laughs> so I went into Arrowhead. Tower Records, which you could do in the day, right? And I went to the jazz guy, who you know, we all knew that each guy had their specialty and all that. And I went to the jazz guy and I said, "Does the word Arrowhead mean anything to you?" And so he he said yes, and so he showed me this record. And I'm sorry for the glare. I wish I could get rid of it. If um, you just tilt tilt down a little bit, tilt forward or upward go. or sideways. Or upward or something. Wayne Johnson, so this Arrowhead. Wayne Johnson. Yeah. yeah so this I knew. is Wayne Johnson. When you said Arrowhead, so, I knew it was going to be Wayne Johnson. Yeah. So this is Wayne Johnson uh, with Jimmy Johnson and Bill Berg. Um, and Bill so Berg. I I got this record. And this is like, to me, one of the best records in the universe like this is just an unbelievable record and what's really funny is this is his first record and then um and i'm still living up in northern california but i would come down to la and visit and come down to visit my brother and i would like run down to melrose and scour the used record stores for for to try and find more wayne johnson records you know i knew that there was an i knew that he had done another one and and so I ended up getting Grasshopper, which is great. You know, I, I haven't heard much from him lately. I don't know what he's up to the last ten or twenty years. Yeah, he's a he's a Taylor guy. He's a rep for Taylor guitars. And Taylor guitars. He's not, not he's not making suits. No, he's not. Making well, suits. 
<laughs> so I'll show you a record that's very okay. relevant. This is one okay. of the rarest recordings in all of America because this is the original. Oh my god! <laughs> oh wow! Let's see, this is the original Dave Boswell trio 1986 i still have it nice. with dean wow. taba john mosser and i saw you guys play wow. to support this a couple times but uh, i still have my cassettes and wow. uh cool awesome it's not, it's not wow, autographed, that's cool <laughs> i hope you still have a copy have, i should so. have that transferred actually to uh, vinyl i should have a transfer to vinyl and then that back to, and then back to 78 and then back to yeah there you go. I've got a cassette player, but it's not hooked up to a computer. I could do that with a laptop maybe someday if I really yeah. if I really oh am bored. But uh cool. That was my one Thank of my surprises. That. Oh, that's cool. You know, that so that music was was like really heavily influenced by Wayne Johnson because it was a tree, it was a guitar trio, mm -hmm. and you know, um just the sounds that were coming out were something that I really like sort of gravitated to. Um Gosh, and then um, I'm gonna, get, I'm, gonna go, I'm gonna go back a few years mm -hmm. um, in influences. I'm gonna go to actually my first two records, my two first two vinyl that I ever got. Um, this was this is what I asked for for Christmas when I was in like third grade. Johnny, yeah, Johnny your parents Cash. must have loved that. So I got it, and then this was the other one. The Abbey Road. Beatles. Okay. Yeah. So, of course. And, um, you know, it was funny because this Abbey Road record um, was my sharing. When I went in, like, second and third grade, we, you know, so the kids would have their pet rat and they, or they'd have their dog and cat or whatever. And I'm like, here's my, I'm sharing Abbey Road. And then I started talking and the teacher was loving it. She's like, Oh wow, that's great, David. What can you tell us about it? So I was like giving her all the scoop on it. And then she said, Well, maybe this afternoon we'll listen to that. I'm sure she was like a huge Beatle fan. She's like, Oh my that's god, cool. this is cool. We get to listen to Abbey Road this afternoon instead that of that was my favorite record when I was kids. in um a little later, probably sixth, seventh, eighth grade. I I used to put it on repeat and just let it go for like 20 spins in a row. So yeah. well, definitely sure I, influential record yeah, for sure. I'm sure if I threw this on a turntable now, it would just be, it yeah. would be pretty, you know. Needle, needle rot, we call that. A lot of needle. So what do you call it? Needle rot. Needle rot, yes. You just, it just kind of scrapes out the grooves. <laughs> so let's get so let's get to some other records here. Keep. Okay. What else you got to show Keep us? Okay, so this was another one that I was heavily influenced by. Miles, for sure. Miles Davis, Seven Steps to Heaven. Is this is this um, the Wayne Shorter group of Miles Davis? I don't know who uh, plays on which record. Is, yeah, Herbie Hancock, uh, George Coleman, uh, Tony Williams, and Ron Carter, Frank Butler on drums. They had a California session and a New York session. So I just uh, really kind of dug dug what was happening on any, this record. Any big tunes on there that I would recognize? Um, seven steps to heaven. Dum, bum, 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 ba, da, dum. So that was kind of that tune right there, Joshua. Um, yeah, I mean, this is just a great record, you know. Um, I had actually one of the other teachers that I had up in San Francisco. I, I, I found this other guitar teacher, and he was fantastic. And he would, um, He'd, he'd invite me into his living room after the lesson and he had all this vinyl just stacked up along the wall and he just went through pulled out and just handed me the stack of records <laughs> and i'm like what are you doing he says this is part of your homework this is just your homework listen to, these Go listen to this bring and, them back and it, Don't was scratch them. it was really great because this is one of them that he kind of turned me on to george benson, george benson. yep that's and, on Columbia. Yeah, George Benson. A lot of people don't realize that George Benson was a serious jazz guitar player before he got a little more commercial. And I have some of his early records. I might have one somewhere. I can't find it. Yeah. I got a couple of George oh, Bensons crazy. laying around. He's so crazy. He's so crazy good. And I think the whole pop, you know, when he did Breezin, 
that sort of was very toned down. I mean, it's fantastic playing, of course, you know, but very toned down, very pop, and and his and his voice. He's got a wonderful voice, and he, you know, obviously got on the pop train and said, "Hey, I can make a lot of money." You could actually you know, make some money, money rather than starving to money, death, right? That's okay. Yeah, but I mean, if just his stuff before that is phenomenal, it's just you know, yeah, he's, I've got, he's got a few of his records. Definitely, All right, I'm going to show a record. Please. This is from the from the Dave Boswell. Um, what's the word? History lesson, and. Okay. Oh, Jeff Richmond. Who knows Jeff Richmond? Not that many people know him, but when you and I first started hanging out, you're like, we got to go see Jeff Richmond play tonight. And I'm like, who's Jeff Richmond? And you're like, he's this guy who plays a lot of Wayne Shorter tunes. And I said to myself, who's Wayne Shorter? So that's how far <laughs> that's how far I've Stank. come. I was, yeah, a new, I was a newbie into jazz at that point, but uh, I've seen him a bunch of times. Uh, you know, I saw him a couple times and He's still around, you know, he's still he's, big potato and stuff like that. Do you actually know him or you've just seen him? Yeah, I do. I yeah. actually saw him last time. Um, I think it was when I, when I went to see uh, a Simon Phillips band, uh, Jeff was there because Jeff and Simon are good friends. And uh, Jeff's just like the, the nicest human on the planet and great uh, writer and just, you know, uh, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. You and uh, know, what was I going to say about you know, Jeff? Um, I would see him at shows like in the audience. He's like, he always goes to see other shows. I'm like, oh yeah, he's, he doesn't know me. So we'll, we'll get is, him to, we'll get him to do an interview here one of these days. After yeah, that'd be great. He'd, up. He'd, actually, he'd probably, probably go for he it. He would love it. He yeah. would totally love it, actually. Cool. He, it'd be great to talk to him about vinyl because he, you know, was really, yeah, I mean, those who grew up in, in the day. But yeah, Jeff's great. Cool. Um, what else do I have? Some some other other huge influences. This was like when I was still in high school. Aldi Miola. Mm -hmm. You know who doesn't who doesn't love Aldi Miola? I mean, this record just kind of blew my mind. I'm like, oh my god, this you can actually do do this with a guitar. It was kind of scary. He did amazing <laughs> stuff, but you know, does he really do jazz, or is is his tonal palette really? Is it jazz or some Spanish? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The scales yeah. and chords that he uses doesn't fit into jazz. Well, he's in Return to Forever, so he, he can, I yeah. guess, play anything. Yeah. I but mean, he kind of really, stands out in his own very unique style. I think you're. I think you're right. I mean, that's kind of, you know. A that's actually, cool. later on, like fast forward ten years after that record, he made these like Brazilian records, like almost sounded like Pat Metheny's later stuff. With synths and stuff, I don't know if you heard records from that period. Yeah, I did. He started using the guitar synth. Yeah, yeah it was anyway. interesting. I think it's cool. It's really cool. Um, and then what else you show us? This, what's that? What else you got for us? Here's another one. This is huge, huge, blew my mind. Mike Stern, his first album. Ah, sure? there you go. <laughs> so you've seen that before. Yeah. I knew you'd have that. Was that one of your surprises? Well, I just got this on vinyl recently. I've had it on CD forever. Oh, okay. But I just saw I it in a record and store. I just, noticed, I just noticed that Mitch Foreman plays on that record. I didn't even know that. I was looking at it the other day. <laughs> Who's on here? Bob, Bob Bird. Jocko plays on here. What? Yeah, Jocko's, Jocko's Jocko on here. Jocko plays on here. Wow. Mark Egan. Yeah. Yeah, this used to, used to play this, Incredible. spin this record all the time. Yeah. And I know you're a huge Mike Stern fan. And for those... Uh, viewers who are new to jazz but are really into rock, he's a good place to kind of jump in because he plays blistering electric guitar solos on a Telecaster or yeah. like a Telecaster, yeah. and he's very uh, accessible to rock fans, I would say. Yeah, Mike's, Mike is incredible, incredible. And we, you and I got together to see him. You've probably seen him a million times. I've only seen him once. I and that was, I see, he can, yeah. You see him every year. I see him every year. It's like in December, he comes to LA, and there's two things I look forward to in December, and that's Santa and Mike Stern. You know what I mean? It's like, well, I saw him with you. So you and I went to see him, was that last year? Took my son, and uh, I got to meet Mike after the show. You kind of helped introduce us. And uh, yeah, that was the first time I saw Dave Wickle play live. and. Oh, that was he was mind blowing too, just the power oh, coming yeah. off of his drum. Yeah. 
So that was a very cool show. And now Catalina is kind of struggling as a, as a jazz club with the, the COVID. Like I said, we're having a fundraiser. That's what did, I did I show your, uh, your goodies? I forgot to do that. I meant to have this running for 20 minutes. Oh. <laughs> we got a few more records to show, but before I forget, Guys, you can listen to Dave's stuff on davidboswell.com, and there's his Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. You can follow him on all your social medias and uh, check out his playing online before you purchase the record if you want to. Okay, now that that's going to scroll for a while, what else? Anything else to show? Um, One more well, little thing to show. Is, I'll show this. This is kind of fun. This is this was Robin Ford's first record. Yeah, I got uh, that one. And the and what's kind of fun on this is that this is where, you know, he and so that that's Jimmy. Is that Nashville. Jimmy with his uh, full uh, hair and beard? Yeah, full, yeah, full hair and beard. Um, so that's kind of fun. And you, you know, Robin was Robin sort of was my uh, connection to Jimmy because my brother had worked with Robin and knew Robin. And um, so that, so when I kind of, you know, first reached out to Jimmy, I said, you know, hey, I'm friends with Robin Ford. And it was like, oh, cool. Like I In took that case. my ball. <laughs> so, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, that record was kind of a precursor to the Yellow Jackets, like right. two thirds of the band right there. And then the Yellow Jackets album. A total mind blowing album for me when that first yeah. came out yeah. in the early 80s. Yeah. And, Huge fan of theirs at that point. And uh, yeah, Robin is still around doing stuff. And, you know, I've seen him play out here in uh, the Canyon Club a couple times in the last few years. Still yeah. sounded great. Oh, he's amazing. I'll show an album that's, that's an album only because it has a story. Did you have more to say about Robin? No, I was just going to say um, he's in Nashville now. He's living in Nashville. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and he so, plays a really cool custom guitar. You know, oh my God. you know that guitar he's playing? It's some well, weird, got, uh, unusual. Yeah, he's got some. I mean, he custom has, thing. A, he has quite a collection. <laughs> but he's he went from <laughs> blues to sort of jazz fusion, and then he went back to blues. And most blues players do not have the palette of of you know all that stuff, chords and scales. He's way beyond most blues yeah. players in terms of what he can do to a, to a guitar. Right. Super here's, a, all. here's an album that has a story behind it. It's not one of his best records necessarily. Pat Metheny and oh, there's people. Does she know there's she's people. on camera? She's on camera. Hi, she's join us. Camera. She's crawling. She's crawling. I feel like I want to video her crawling out of the room. I did that yesterday because my son was complaining that I was on his uh, in the middle of his class and I had to crawl on the floor. It's like, okay, you really that embarrassed to see your dad? In front oh, of your class. So it. anyway, 1986, oh. Pat did an album with Ornette Coleman called Song X. Kind of one of his weirder, less accessible albums. But on this tour, you and I went to see him play live at Cal Arts. And uh, oh. remember, were you there? Yes. You were there. You were definitely there. Because yes. Cal Arts is where Charlie Hayden used to yes. run the uh, jazz department there. Yeah. yeah. And then afterwards... Oh. We went backstage and you introduced me to Pat Matheny. So that's what I wanted to okay. show. I got to meet Pat finally. You're old I, friends with him, but I got to uh, meet him once for about 10 seconds. So I thought I'd uh, drop that name. That's where, so okay, thank you for introducing cool. me. So that's where that was. Yeah. yeah um, it's I went and saw Ornette Coleman's band up in San Francisco. And that was just the craziest show ever. He only had two one band? Players, when I saw him, he had two bands. Yeah, it was two bands. The double West quartet, West. he calls it. Yep, it was and basically, he sits, he stands in the middle, and he plays into two bands at once, and they're yeah. both doing separate things. Yeah. So yeah. I saw him do that here in L.A., and then I saw him do a reunion with the old-timer guys, you know, uh, what's his name, uh, Charlie Hayden, and uh, was Dewey Redmond there? I saw him do that kind of reunion tour, acoustic, yeah. which I kind of like better. Yeah. So she's cool. She's crawling. She's crawling again. You can change. You can move the. You can move the camera so we can see who's crawling yeah. around. I'm gonna move it up so she doesn't have to crawl. Well, okay. Oh, thanks, honey. You're gonna be nice. Just walk. Just walk. Man, there's just a person back away. there. She's. She can come on. She can talk. Dave, anything else to show us? 
Um, We've gone 40 uh, minutes. Here. You can throw in another yeah, one or two really quickies. Uh, let me just, uh, well, I'm going to show this really quickie. Let's see. Sweating in here. Oh, uh, gosh. I, I just have so much. I think we're going to have to do like a part two. We'll do volume um, two, this, three, and four. This is a huge, huge influence on me. Keith Jarrett record. Keith, yeah. I love Keith also. Um, belonging. Love this record. Um, this was a record that was given to me when I was 16 years old by my, uh, by my, uh, cousin. She sent it from, she lived in New York. She said, if you, you musicians, cause if we were all musicians in the family, you guys got to listen to this guy. Okay. So we started, I started listening and I was like, I put the record away because it was like <laughs> I had no idea what was going on. I just too like, much, this too is much to too, start with. This is too yeah. weird, too much, you know. And it really wasn't, you know, until after I went to music school and kind of like figured out, like, wow, okay, they're it's like on another planet, but it's pretty amazing. Now I kind of get what they're doing. Yeah, I've um, got, I've got that one. He's got two or three live at the Vanguard. I've got at least two of them. Definitely cool. Yeah. Cool live records. Definitely cool. And then this will be the last one I'll share today, but I just wanted to, you know, we are really, this is actually my very first vinyl record ever. And um, it is may it the not be Is it the Monkees vinyl. or the Partridge family? No, it's, 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 it's actually it's <laughs> Pinocchio. It's before the Monkees. And you can see <laughs> that I took ownership of it by writing my name on it in crayon. I see David. And then um, what does it say at the other side? Yeah, it's a horrible, like, you know, first grader writing Boswell. That's cute. Something as well. Yeah. I, so got, that's, uh, I got records that are that old. So I'm not going to show them today, <laughs> but that's cool. <laughs> that's That started my vinyl. Uh, my vinyl fetish world. going back <laughs> four or five <laughs> decades. Exactly. That's exactly. great. Dave, I think we should wrap up, but I appreciate you coming on. Great stories about your uh, your career, etc. And looking forward to hearing the new CD. So plug everybody again. DaveBoswell.com. You can go listen to his music and order his stuff. And don't forget to subscribe to me also. Vinyl Rundown on YouTube and Vinyl Rundown on Instagram. Hey, it was a lot of fun, Dave. Hope we get thank get together and so see you for soon. Inviting me. I yeah. Know. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really honored. And um, man, you really made me uh, on a nostalgic run when I started looking through all every single vinyl record I had. I was having memory. So thank you for that. That's I'm cool. glad we're keeping Amazing. the love of vinyl alive and hopefully yeah. introducing some people to uh, your music and jazz. So cool, Dave. Stay safe. Awesome. And Be let's safe. check out. Be well. We will talk to you soon. Thanks again. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you guys. We're done. Have a good one.